Hey, Group 2 Groupies. Uh, this is your friend, the limo driver, coming to you uh, live from Dr. Carroll's office. And I want to thank all of you for submitting so many wonderful uh, questions to me. I'm going to try to uh, group them according to topic and try to address each. And the first one has to do is musical texture. And uh, Alicia and Cricket had uh, some questions about how to uh, distinguish between polyphonic and homophonic texture. And I think it's probably easiest to determine uh, textures that are polyphonic if you have very different melodies being uh, played together or if there is imitation and you can hear the monkey see monkey do a game of musical tag where you have leaders and followers but unfortunately uh, a lot of music was written that uh, has very little distinctions between layerings of melodies and really it is very difficult to determine one from the other so uh, in its most extreme forms homophonic and polyphonic perhaps are meaningful terms but uh, if anything, you now know the concept of uh, layering of melodies or simply having a predominant melody that is supported by secondary, less important harmonies. Uh, there was a question that Zach had about instruments, and he wanted to know about the harpsichord, and if the harpsichord kind of just died out really fast or if it had a slow death. <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, Zach's question applies more to the Baroque period because it was in the Baroque period that the piano was invented. It was called the forte piano back then, forte meaning loud, piano meaning soft, and uh, it was developed around 1720. Now that's quite a, a time away from the from the Renaissance, because the Renaissance comes to a close about 1600. But it took a long time for the piano to uh, re replace the harpsichord, and uh, a good 50 years. We know that when Mozart moved to Vienna in the early 1780s, it was the city of the piano. And being the new kid, the new instrument on the block, it sort of took off, and everybody uh, decided that the harpsichord was just couldn't do all the things that the piano could do. So the harpsichord did uh, have a slow death, uh, eventually being replaced by the piano in the 1770s and 1780s. Uh, Colby wanted to know about women uh, playing the various kinds of Renaissance instruments. Uh, recall that there was a distinction between the loud instruments and the soft instruments. The guys got to play the loud ones and the ladies got to play the, the soft ones, and she wanted to know uh, if uh, some women might not have played some of the loud ones. <laughs> uh, well, uh, to be honest with you, I'm sure that a few tried them, but bear in mind that uh, there were very uh, rigid uh, codes of behavior back then, and uh, women wanted to be ladies. They wanted to be uh, dainty, and they didn't want to be associated with those big loud instruments. So uh, they were simply doing what was appropriate and normal according to their uh, society norms. Uh, Julie asked a question about uh, science. Uh, was science more important than music during the Renaissance? Did science replace uh, the arts? Did the arts take a back seat? Well, one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, music was considered one of the sciences. It was part of the quadrivium, if you will. And so there was no kind of distinction between music as being sort of secondary in importance to science. It was all part of the scientific bag, if you will. So just wanted to share that insight with you. And another one, uh, Callie asked, uh, she wanted to know about the women in the paintings. Now, uh, the women in the paintings, particularly when you move into the Baroque period, and I'm looking at a man named Rubens, uh, who painted uh, women, uh, and they're very voluptuous, they're curvy, they're kind of chunky. <laughs> uh, and she wanted to know uh, if there was, uh, what the reason behind this was. Well, uh, many artists depicted uh, women as what they would constitute as being uh, symbols of, of beauty, uh, paragons of beauty, uh, the epitome, if you will. And uh, what we discover is that in the 1600s, and probably late 1500s as well, uh, it was the woman who had a little extra weight to her bones who was considered healthy because they didn't have penicillin back then. And if you got sick, well, 
you may have to, uh, you may not be up for eating for a while. And it was one way of helping to preserve your, 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 your health by having uh, a little bit more weight. If you were skinny, you'd be looked upon as being very scrawny. Also, it sort of sent a message to the guys, uh, if they were free to be on the dating scene, that, hey, I know how to cook, and I cook good because look at me, I eat my food. And, of course, you know, the fastest way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So uh, what you see in paintings, really, uh, over time constitute the cultural norm for beauty uh, back in that day. Well, uh, I'm going to have to go, but uh, wishing you all well, and... Uh, Study for the final. Talk to you soon. Bye.